a lot of sanction packages uh, ongoing in the European Union. I believe today we have the 12th or 13th one stopped to count. Uh, however, there are some countries who are only sanctioning war important goods and not dual use goods. Is Germany one of them? Yes, and Hungary. And the question is why? And it is really a, a pity for us because uh, in the parliament there is a majority to improve the sanctions and to exclude war important uh, goods. There's also machines for a CNC production and so on, but this is not yet done. Also nitrocellulose, which is a kind of cotton, is also exported from Germany to Russia. Because just recently complained that we cannot yeah. produce ammunition because we yeah. lack... Yeah. And cellulose. also the question of ship-to-ship -ship transfer. Those ships have to be stopped in other harbors and uh, there are several other smaller items. Um, the challenge is that there are also some enterprises specialized on procuring, for example, chips in Turkey or in Armenia or even in China, and they are private enterprises who are purchasing washing machines and exploiting their technical devices, which we then find in Russian uh, missiles, for example. So there is a coalition of Turk, oh, sorry, Turkey, of Russia, Iran, North Korea, and China. And China is the country which is trying to cooperate, for example, with Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, who have increased their import numbers for washing machines by 15 times in, Azab in uh, Kazakhstan and by more than 1,000 times in Kyrgyzstan, probably from five a year to 5,000 a year. And this, is, this could be sanctioned with the enterprises, but they say, well, we, we sell them to private enterprises and these are intermediators. So we have to look who are the intermediators and have to stop them. There is a uh, special investigation in the German media, so I see that these um, holes are going to be stopped. But we have to be very honest, it's not only Hungary, it's also Germany in this context, and this is not a question to the parliament, it's also not really to the government, it's the free economy we have and the lack of a self-understanding of these enterprises that they are responsible. In France there are more state-owned enterprises so it's easier to control them. We have a very small number of state-owned enterprises but not in this context and so it's much diff more difficult to control it but therefore we should be a little bit more um, decent and a little bit more uh, smart, smarter in this context uh, to stop and to contain this. Um, well, is it going after individual companies now, or can we uh, adopt the French model? Can we reduce? Can we increase the um, regulation of the free market, which at the end of the day should be regulated by the government? Well, uh, it's very simple to be resolved uh, to contain dual-use goods. And washing machines are dual-use goods, and this is part of the 13th package, and Germany was against it. But then we have to talk to Bosch Siemens Hausgeräte and others and have to tell them, well, show us where you want to export to, and we will give you restrictions or better regulations, but don't sell them where, to anybody who is requesting them. So this is possible, but this needs more political will and also a self uh, a kind of, 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 of self-conscience and a question of, of own strategic um, mindset to stop the, the export. Uh, one example is, for, is, is Infineon, um, where Infineon chips are exported since 2014 and now they are ready to stop it. The other is, uh, are, are banks, so to, to, to freeze bank accounts uh, like Commerzbank and others who have to do a little bit more and to help Ukraine and not to foster their relationship with Russia. Well, I guess um, that's your, now your turn because uh, we're talking about international regulations and how it can be implemented and how we can differentiate when we're talking about exclusively defense, um, defense issues and when we talk about free economy. Um, from your experience, um, is it possible to introduce such a, an effective sanction regime that it would not be 100% bulletproof, but at least um, would prevent such uh, mass-scale sanction evasion schemes? It's a big challenge. Um, 
especially in the United States, the idea of export controls as being part of your national security uh, was divorced for a long time. Uh, even at NATO, they used to have an export control committee at NATO. Uh, but after the end of the Cold War, so many of the non-military instruments of power were, were, were let go from NATO and either given back to the nations themselves or reconcentrated in the European Union. And while I think the EU has done a great job, and I'm, I'm very grateful for the sanctions and for everything like that, the idea that NATO itself, which has so many non-EU members, Norway, Turkey, the United States, Canada, I mean, the, the idea that they outsource a lot of this to the EU, and even within the EU, you have Cyprus and Malta and Hungary who, and Austria, you know, who, who may be against these things. It strikes me as a little bit odd. I think NATO needs to claw back some of these non-military instruments of power. Uh, again, in the Cold War, it was not the case that they would outsource these things. Um, and, and there's no reason why they can't use the European Union and other organizations where NATO members also have membership to increase their reach, to increase their span of control. But I think these things should be decided at NATO headquarters among allies, should then be used in these other organizations. But Export control itself, I mean, this is literally arms control. This is literally controlling arms. And unfortunately for too many countries, especially in the West, it's seen as individual national profitability and boostering of, your, uh, of commerce, uh, the individual companies themselves lobbying against the government for restrictions. Um, but I think this is a, a case where it's actually inhibition or a lack of political will or a lack of focus from the West to really say, let's close all of the loopholes humanly possible. We know where they're taking advantage of resellers. We know where these chains are going. Um, but the political will to work with industry, to shut down all these avenues is very difficult. We've lost the muscle memory, as we say, uh, in the United States. Uh, and it's time for a much more muscular export control policy. Um, there was a colleague of mine actually in the Trump administration, Chris Ford, who put this very, very well. He said, we have to work together to make sure our friends can run fast and our enemies run slower. And that means things like export control. That means things like uh, coordinating on trade. That means working with not just allies, but with partners as well. Um, but it's just, it's, it's something that we have fallen out of the habit and we have to rebuild that habit and really shut all these things down and show politicians that the cost of them not doing it is actually higher than the cost of them doing it. And that we're costing lives here. When we open up an Iranian drone and it still has American chips in it, that is a huge failure of American export control system. And the people in uh, Expos at the State Department and the Commerce Department need to work together to shut those loopholes down. It's on them that, that Americans uh, you know, in the Middle East, that Ukrainians uh, on the battlefield are being struck by these weapons, uh, that our partners and friends in the Middle East are dealing with these kinds of drones all the time with American ships in it. It's, it's an embarrassment. And we all need to work together to close these loopholes and shut down Russia, and North Korea and uh, Iran from having access to these things, this coalition that is working together on missiles and on drones, it's, it's, it, it's just a true embarrassment. Um, would the appointment of a new um, General Secretary of NATO be such, a, such an occasion to start introducing um, tighter export control measures? Or would the person appointed to this position have enough of their plate already to be able to deal with export controls in addition to it while having a institution with no institutional memory of how controlling those those matters. I mean, let me just say right up front, uh, I think Secretary Jens Stoltenberg has been one of the greatest secgens in NATO's history. The number of tasks he's taken on, the fact that he's survived and thrived and helped the Allies increase security at a time when I think the wrong person in that job would have not supported Ukraine as much, would not have transformed NATO's uh, defense and deterrence policy as much, would not have maintained support of 30 and now 32 allies. I, I mean, absolutely extraordinary. Finland and Sweden, uh, uh, Montenegro, uh, North Macedonia. The, the, the way Stoltenberg has done things has been truly extraordinary. I know that at SHAPE, uh, the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, uh, two of his predecessors, and Steve Covington, uh, who's the advisor to the SecGen, have been working really hard to claw back some of these non-military instruments of power and to reintegrate military and non-military instruments of power at NATO to remind the ambassadors that they have this capability. But there's still within NATO, I think, uh, some allies, and, and in some ways it's France, in some ways it's Germany, who want to use the EU as sort of a counterbalance to 
uh, U.S. and U.K. leadership uh, within European security and want to maintain that sort of independence. And that's usually been the historic block within NATO has been France, has been France wanting to preserve the right for it to be the, the bigger player in the EU. And of course, is another boss. absolutely. But also the Franco-German engine has normally been what really runs the EU and has you know, necessarily um, uh, advanced. Now that that engine has broken down and Macron is actually leading uh, in terms of trying to support Ukraine, maybe he could be convinced that you know standing up more powers within NATO is not actually a, di a diminution of France's autonomy or power within Europe, but actually a way to enhance its leadership within NATO and within the EU. Not to take prerogatives away from the EU, but just to remember that if you're a NATO member state and you're not an EU member, that you still have the right to work with NATO allies to wield these non-military instruments of power to deter Russia, to support our allies and partners and friends to help defend Ukraine. One of the biggest problems in, in the whole sanctions quagmire is uh, implementation. And the EU is great in working on regulations, but it has no muscle to implement them. And also the, sort of the, 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 the special envoy for sanctions, they, they're looking into implementation. They're looking like, is Austria, is Hungary, uh, that needs to translate the EU regulation into domestic exports laws, drafting these laws correctly. But nobody's controlling them, are they actually implementing it? And that's, that's the huge problem because, first of all, some countries don't have the muscle themselves, especially smaller ones. They don't have a really capable foreign intelligence uh, service. Uh, they don't have diplomatic or, or, or trade attaches that can actually double check or do due diligence. Uh, either companies buy that because they're afraid of uh, extraordinary US sanctions or they just don't and and in in these days they just don't and the second thing is then you have states like Austria and Hungary that are basically doing the minimum they can they, they don't object the legislation because they know that that will will have a cost in Brussels you know you would pay for that if you are a sanction spoiler but you just don't implement them um, and it's much harder for for other countries to um, to basically see, oh, our stuff is going out via Hungary or via Austria, and you know, it's much much easier to hide. The next thing is uh, fines, uh, court terms, um, time, and here I'm looking at Germany, uh, uh, and and time it actually needs to really conf sort of get get managers into jail, uh, German legal system, the courts are so overworked, prosecutory service, they are clocked, there is, it's a capacity issue. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of the bad guys, they say, well, we can export, you know, nobody's going to bust us. And if, and if the fines are so ineligible, you know, I mean, it's, you can run on high profit selling to Russia, and if you're caught, you know, you're paying, uh, you, you're paying a nominal fee. Um, that needs to change as well. There, need, there needs to be punishment for, for misdeeds. There needs to be also a clear consciousness in legislations that these are not kind of um, cavalier affairs. You know, it's, it's really these people help Russia kill people. And you're basically committing second degree murder if you, if you uh, export this stuff to Iran, to Iran or to Russia. Uh, that, that mindset isn't there yet. Uh, and, and this harshness of our penal system isn't there yet, but it, it needs to come there. Otherwise, uh, you will always find a crook who for a decent margin will resell this stuff.